Hello everyone, welcome to the supporters Q&A. These are questions submitted by my Patreon and subscribers to supporters. And as host, more or less, we have Bismarck, Bismarck. from Military Aviation History. Right, let's start with them. Uh, Guy wants to know uh, something about the logistics on the Eastern Front here, it seems. Uh, an interesting tidbit that came my way through the excellent We Have Ways podcast. France had a reasonably high per capita number of cars and hence a robust infrastructure to support this. So when France was invaded by Germany, could use this to the blitzkrieg advantage. In comparison, Russia had a low car number when you compare it to the size of its territory, which would have been a contributing factor to the difficulty of invasion. Do you, you have other interesting logistic tidbits that had a very important but rarely discussed effect on the war? So I first need to make some stuff clear. Um, I generally don't like the word Blitzkrieg as Ooh. much as um, I w will just link a video which discusses the term because it was not used by the Germans and is also usually used in the wrong way. Mm. Um, now to the question what is rarely discussed differently, the Germans use trains first the Soviets as outlined in my Soviet logistics video. And here to quote, the Soviet engines moved at a slow speed which allowed them to be driven with basic signaling, in some cases using soldiers with flags, with small intervals between trains and the high density of trains on the line. Tracks could be used in a circular manner, with loaded trains coming down on a good track and lighter unloaded trains returning on poor track. And what is also important, the Soviets managed to evacuate a lot of their trains when the mm. Germans advanced but they lost a lot of the train network. So what did they have? They had more trains available than, so they had an over, over capacity on, on, on moving elements, but had less of a train network. The Germans had, I think, the opposite problem. And here's the quote. The Soviets lose around 40% of the network while losing 15% of the motive power, which meant that for the rest of the war, they would have an abundance especially as the bottom economy required less traffic to do a switch to freight away from passenger traffic. This allowed the simultaneous evacuation of the great cities by the millions of Soviet citizens and the war industries moved to the Urals. So this is one tidbit I think which is mostly forgotten. So the Soviets, um, this, these are quotes from Davy e. H.G. W. Davy who is one or the expert on Soviet logistics. And he basically states that the Soviets were very well in using low, low quality, you could say, train lines and, and stuff to get everything going. Like they use slow trains, but larger ones, the mm -hmm. Germans tended to move faster, but then you need different signaling techniques and everything else. So you have a different approach here, how, how they were done. Yeah. And this is something which I think is near, I, I didn't encounter it at all or somewhere else. I mean, I didn't read too much on logistics because it's a topic which is very important, but also, yeah, few dependent. Yeah. And occasionally I do them, but they are also quite understudied as well. So Yeah, that's the big problem often. Um, right, Julian wants to know, a topic I struggle to find a meaningful amount of information is the naval aspect of the German-Soviet war in World War II. Although this may be beyond the scope of this Q&A, I would greatly appreciate some insight into this topic or references or sources you consider to be of solid quality. Thanks, really enjoying your work. Okay, first off, okay, thank you. Um, first off, I don't know very much about this. And if you think about it, so what major ships do you know from the Kriegsmarine that were sunk by the Soviets? For me, there is only one ship that comes to mind, and this is the Wilhelm Gustloff. It's not even Kriegsmarine. Yeah, that's not even Kriegsmarine. That's mm -hmm. a ship, yeah. So, and this was a passenger ship uh, at the end of the war, and I think it was full of refugees. Well, nobody's 100% sure who was on there, but yeah. mainly refugees and uh, uh, some soldiers probably as well. We and, don't know. And it was sunk. So, this is actually the only, I don't know if there was any major ship, so Bismarck Tirpitz, the Panzerschiff, all the others sank basically. There was another refugee ship in the same category as Gustloff. But so, so as, as you can see, this already gives a bit of a frame that 
there was probably something limited going on or, or on a different scale. Mm. So maybe there was a lot of fighting with small ships like with the, with the S-boats and everything. But about books, um, basically I suggest your name indicates that you likely can read German. I would highly recommend to you Seemacht Heute, um, the German version. It's, is it actually Seemacht Heute? I think it's Seemacht. And this is basically a book by Potter and Nimitz, the English one. And the Germans extended it. And especially for, for the German parts in the second World War by Rohr, who is, was, or was, because he's dead, a leading German military historian on, on naval warfare. And you should get this book really cheap secondhand. I got it again, and it's, it's pretty, some basic outlines there. This, some stuff is, of course, stated. And it's also a huge thing, and there's an index on all the ships back then. And another book from Roa is Stalin's Ocean-Going Fleet, Sober Naval Strategy and Shipbuilding Programs from 1935 to 1953. I don't know the book, but there should be something in there, at least for the Soviet side, which is usually under, under studied and everything. And of course, I asked Drache Niffel. Thank you very much here, Drache Niffel, who is the, if you don't know, he's, he's the, basically the, the naval guy on, on YouTube. And to quote him, there's actually relatively little written about the subject as a whole. It tends to be overshadowed by land and air war. Most of these books that cover the subject focus on specific theaters, the Arctic, Baltic and Black Seas. There are a couple that cover the U-boat campaign in two or three of those, but most seem to look at one or the other. And he recommends one book for the Baltic, Gros, Gruz, so G R double O. Double S pool, uh, the naval war in the Baltic, 1939 to 1945. And I think you read that already. Or read read that already. Yeah. It's all right. Okay, so Jonas wants to know modern topics again, when, and Cold War as well, exclamation mark. Yes, um, modern topics. So I, 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 I double checked, he means contemporary topics. Actually, we are planned for 2019. I think I didn't do any, or at least not on my main channel. And yes, it was planned, but I didn't come across anything where I said, okay, that's it. So, and COBA as well, yeah, both are planned and I already did some outlining for this year, of course. And it's definitely planned, but in the end, yeah, contact with the enemy is always determining what, what's finally I, I do or not. Because generally, well, the two videos for me require a bit less work or I can do them on a higher quality, at least I think, than most other stuff by now. So for contemporary and also especially Cold War, I have to do a lot more reading to get the context and everything right and to make sure. And I also have very limited literature on this as well. Mm. So with the Second World War, I have, I have a lot already and I, I know a lot sometimes where I can find what I need um, and the other thing is um, the focus is going more on World War II and on Germany especially since well I can read German and I'm also using way more primary resources now as some of you have might noticed I mean I think for instance the Sturmtiger video that stuff was what was published in this um, I don't think this was ever used in a book so far so the primary source how to use it, the, the leaflet or the, no, the Denkschrift, the memorandum. So, and I want to do actually more on that stuff than just rehash what was written in books all the time and something is wrong. Um, what do I have written here? Yeah, also, yeah. This is also, like mentioned before, I'm, I'm, I'm regularly encountering errors now in World War II literature and I'm more keen on getting my own hands dirty in the archives nowadays. So there's also a focus why more or shift on World War II was stronger last year and probably will continue this way. Good. Then Brad wants to know, I've visited a number of World War I sites in France over the years, so Verdun, Arras, and so on. I noticed the bulk of visitors and even the small memorials, Fort Dumont, are German. Uh, as a German speaker, not German, I understand. Um, can you understand why this may be? I don't have statistics to prove anything, just anecdotal evidence. I have actually no idea, but 
you might gonna know because you are a bit more familiar with France and everything. Yeah, so uh, obviously World War One, France, Germany, lots of fighting going on there, and along the front lines or where the front line used to be, you will find many many small memorials. We start from the uh, the small uh, uh, monument aux morts, which are in all the little towns where they have you know the fallen from that specific village over to the big cities over to then where the battles actually took place and sometimes on the countryside you also find small memorials so there's a lot of them and there's quite a few german ones as well because during the interwar period there was actually quite a lot of uh, contact between the two mm. veterans um, communities and quite a few actually sort of memorial services that were also shared between the two where they you know would pro promise never to have war again and so on and so forth um, and then there is a few big memorials in France, like at Sedan also, where they, it is really just a memorial for German soldiers. And theoretically speaking, I think it should be financed and also taken care of by the German um, Kriegsgräberfürsorge, or the, the organization for, for essentially war memorials. War memorials uh, so let's so call it that. Um, but I think the French actually take a lot of that under their own wing. So as far as I know, the memorial in Sedan, I might be wrong on this, so don't quote me on it. But from what I remember from my work back then, uh, that was actually saved by French historians. About 400 French historians signed the petition that the German memorial in Sedan is going to be refurbished and revamped. Because uh, I think the German side either couldn't do it. Um, and because it's... It's very German the memorial. It's essentially just a concrete box. Uh, it's really just BAM! Yeah. A very heavy, very sort of melodramatic. Um, and in, in that sense, yeah, you do find them. And there is actually on the French side a lot of effort to keep these memorials you know, nice, clean, taken care of and so on. Um, so yeah, in, in the regions where there was a lot of fighting, you will find sort of crossover memorials for, for both sides. And for Dumont anyway, I mean, there's so much stuff at Dumont. Uh, everybody should go to Verdun at one point. It's a place to visit. It's not a fun place to visit, but it's a place to visit. Right, um, next question. Well, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. Uh, but yeah, Uncle Joe wants to know, um, what do you think of Heinrichi? He did uh, hold hundreds of kilometers during Case Blue with just a few divisions and many other instances. I think he was the finest defensive tactician of World War II, much underrated, would you agree? Also, what do you think about his plan to strip Berlin of its garrison, only partly successful thanks to Goebbels at all, uh, try to hold the oder neisse line as long as he could, hoping that the stalemate would cause the Allies to cross the Elbe? With hindsight, he was dead wrong, but at the time, do you think it was not a crazy idea, given the, his resources and the political climate? Or should he have made a token resistance and saved the Ninth Army from destruction? Thanks. Okay, first off, I'm I'm not a people's person. Yeah, I, I replaced the, the couch in my my flat with, with another shelf of books, and I also prefer systems. So me asking about generals, I I did some like General Mattis, Evan Rommel, um, Guderian. Mm. And there are planned some more videos in German generals. I also wrote already one script and for the upcoming year. But generally me asking for generals, yeah, um, is not particularly um, giving you a satisfying answer probably. The other thing is about finest tactician or something. Mm. There will be a video on this. Thank you. So I thank you for, for this question because this sparked a video idea I already had and I started it but then I dropped it down for another thing and I found a way better source now and I will address this in a very particular way why I don't do such assessments at all and stay away from them for, well, I will, I will argue my point. And about his plans, I'm completely unaware. I'm I'm also not particularly into operational history. So for me, basically, I, I'm trying to understand the basics mostly. And, and I still know very little about the basics, which is also a problem because a lot of the basics I actually not researched at all. Mm. So I, in some cases, I have to go basically in the archives to find something out. I mean, there's, from what we know, not really a, a book on German logistics in the Second World War. And... 
I think there's an, a, one article on the logistics of the Luftwaffe, but that's like 20 pages and I think it's 30 years old. I mean, it yeah. was one of my first five videos I did. Um, so for, for the operational stuff, I know I don't know. With late war, I'm basically the Forkstrom is the most late war thing I know. And yeah, I, I did one video on the Forkstrom, so I'm not a major expert on this. And uh, also there are like five to 10 books on the Forkstrom, I think more or less. So a very limited amount. And uh, I think the latest one is from Yelton, which I used in my Forkstrom video. And I think it's already at least 10 years old again. So I, yeah, I'm sorry, not really a good answer here from my side. And then uh, Robert wants to know, um, do you ever anticipate exploring war crimes committed by the Allies during World War II? One instance in particular is the Biscari massacre and how it may have affected Patton's dismissal. I think you have a clear answer to this one. Yeah, um, first to Robert, nice to, to read you again. We saw each other at Conio, Ohio. So thanks for dropping by. So I made a few notes here and <laughs> it's the first one is no, 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 and no, although never say never. So generally my interest in war crimes is limited. It's, it's similar to, to the whole drug issue. So I did now some reading on German war crimes, but I likely won't publish very much on this in video form at all. In written form, more likely that I make a comment on the statement because it's an extremely delicate subject. Um, and as a German speaker, it's also a bit more delicate, I would say. Um, so I try to keep everything I write or say as watertight as possible for, well, for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons, yeah. So now the other thing is if you mention war crimes, Toxic comments. If you mention like war crime of one faction or one person, then people will, why didn't you mention X? Why didn't you mention the order? Then they start comparing numbers. Then they do the other stuff. And it's, it's, the other thing is YouTube. Likelihood that your video gets demonetized if you talk about too much atrocities or other stuff rises. It, it starts with everything. So in other way, there are absolutely no incentives in any way which I know why I should talk about it. And I was not really interested in the subject. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, finally, about specifically your question, if I start to mention as a German speaker US war crimes, before I covered the German ones extensively, that's a very, very, very bad idea. Yeah. And it's also, it it's, would also be very dubious. And, and I noticed, for instance, like with non-German um, military or, or history YouTubers that they touch subjects we wouldn't even dare to look at or address in certain ways. It's like, how, how we, it's just for us, this is not a good idea to do this. We couldn't do this in some cases, I think. Yeah. We, we might get away with this, but at one point it probably would, would come back to us. So yeah, that's, uh, but the good thing is we have the benefit, we can read usually the German resources pretty well. Yeah. But there are other limitations which come and, and, other, uh, and others have other pr um, limitations due to from which countries they're coming from f to touch certain subjects or not. No, I, I can just echo what Bernhard says as well from my own channel, just you know, to reinforce that a little bit as well. Um, this subject is delicate and if I would make a video about Dresden or something, it would be the same problem. Yeah. Yeah, there would be a millions of comments. Why didn't you talk about Coventry and so yeah, on and so forth? Yeah. It's a loose, loose situation for us. But yeah, I hope that answers everybody's questions. Um, thanks, Bernard, for taking your time to answer the viewers' questions. Yeah, thank, thank you for taking time here. So No worries. So thank you for your support and questions. Yeah, and yeah, thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.